is a true story. I, I missed my exit today and was just in my mind. When I was a little bit later, I normally am. I know y'all have never done that. Um, well, after graduating from East Texas Baptist University in Marshall, Texas, I went to work for that same school in various roles, both in the spiritual life department and in the student life departments there. I would often find myself on a committee of people uh, charged to develop uh, a schedule for student orientations, leadership trainings, and other conferences and retreats and times that we would get together throughout the year. In these meetings, we would schedule times for Bible study. We'd schedule uh, trainings relevant to whatever it was that we were doing, or whatever we were gathering for. Um, we would schedule times of rest and times to eat, and times just to hang out and visit. Um, once we filled all of those time slots, it never failed. There was always some time that needed to be filled, things that we felt needed to be done. Um, and it always happened without fail that someone would say, just kind of in passing, oh, well, we can just put some praise and worship there. It didn't matter if praise and worship was what we had done right before that, that time or right after. Um, praise and worship was always the answer to filling in the slots that we needed to, to fill. Now, since many of you grew up in a UCC setting, some, some or most of you even in this church, you, you may or may not know this, that when, in, when an evangelical talks about uh, times of praise and worship, they usually mean times when someone leads in worship songs, um, often with a guitar, sometimes in a small group. Uh, if, it's, if it is a small group, sometimes it's around a campfire or a living room. Now, these times are more free-flowing times than a typical worship service is. Um, and can be a, sometimes accompanied with crying, uh, with clapping your hands and more expressive movements than we experience here on Sunday mornings. You know, Jeff told me recently that he was in a meeting where the, um, it was a lot more emotive than, than we experience here sometimes. So think, think that. It was during one of these such planning times uh, when, as usual, we needed a slot fill. And someone suggested we fill, fill it with another time of praise and worship. This happened, and a friend of mine caught me rolling my eyes and whispering under my breath, Ugh, not again. Um, me and my friend have laughed about this ever since, and it garnered me the reputation of being a crotchety old man a long time before I actually became a crotchety old man. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't have anything against times when God's people get together for worship. In fact, I think that's the central act of the church. The worship of God is what makes the church the church. It's what makes us the people of God. I also don't have anything against uh, getting together outside of church to sing songs or to pray or to study the Bible. Since the beginning of, of the church, this is what God's people have done. This is what we do. But what really exhausts me is when we feel the need to fill every waking hour on our calendars and on our schedules with something that makes us feel good about us and makes us feel good about our relationship with God. Do you ever get tired of all the things we do to try to impress God? Well, if you do, you aren't alone. Not only are there others of us out there who get exhausted at all this frenzy of God stuff that we sometimes find ourselves in, God can get tired of it as well. If you find yourselves wanting to throw up your hands and saying enough of this, then you're in good company because God often finds himself doing the same thing as well. The passage I read today from Isaiah is a record of God throwing his hands up and saying just that. The verse is opened with this. Hear the word of the Lord. Listen to the teaching of God. Now to us, it seems like God's just trying to get our attention before he tells us something. But the actual language here in the ancient Hebrew paints us a picture of a trial and a courtroom. These were the actual words used to begin legal proceedings in the ancient Near East. God isn't just telling us something. God is taking us to court and laying a case against us. And he spends the next few verses making his case. Did you notice when I was reading the people God was making his case against? Verses 10 and 11. Hear the words of the Lord, 
you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the teachings of God, you people of Gomorrah. Now, as you likely know, when we hear about Sodom and Gomorrah, we often think we know what God has against them. But what we often think the Bible has against Sodom and Gomorrah, the Bible never actually really mentions. If you read the story of the destruction of these two cities uh, in, in Genesis without having an agenda, you'll find that the real sin of Sodom and Gomorrah didn't really have anything to do with sex. But it had to do with their propensity to use power, force, and violence to get what they wanted. Every other time Sodom and Gomorrah was mentioned in the Old Testament, their sin seemed to be the same as this. Their sin was greed and injustice, taking from the weak to build themselves up. And according to this passage I read in Isaiah, the Sodomites and the Gomorrahites seemed to be very religious people. All these things that God uses to begin laying out a case against them, that all these things he said that they did are things um, like burnt offerings, Sabbaths, and religious gatherings. If you notice that these are things often in the Bible that God has commanded God's people to do. Everything I listed here, you can find other places in the Bible where God told his people to do this. But in this passage, God says of these activities, I've had enough. I don't delight in them. I will hide my eyes. I will not listen. It seems God is rolling God's eyes, whispering under God's breath. Ugh, not again. Why is this? Why does God seem to be? So, uh, what does God seem to be so against in this passage um, that He seems to have commanded in other places? I think our answer is found in the remedy that God gives in these uh, verses. God doesn't just take us to court to indict us or to lock us away. That's not how God's justice works. That's how we believe our justice works, but with God, it's something else. Rather, God's judgments of God, or God's judgments of us, have to do with how we can make right what we have done wrong. The rulers of Sodom and the people of Gomorrah were told to wash themselves, to make themselves clean, to seek justice, to rescue the oppressed, to defend the orphan, and plead for the widow. It appears that the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah wasn't what we thought it was. And it wasn't that they worshipped God too much, but rather their sin was that their worship of God was not accompanied with service to God. They filled every slot they had with what they believed was worship, but they ignored God's command to take care of the, the poor and the oppressed. Their worship was like me driving my truck this morning. They just forgot what they were doing. They were in church on Sunday mornings, but passing laws and decrees on Monday mornings that held down the poor and the less fortunate, that kept the, the widows and the children unfed, that put a wall around their city to keep the refugees. Their sin was injustice. The remedy was justice. You know, we live here in Central Texas in a very religious place. We joke that there's a church on every corner, and in Waco, where many of us live, is one of the handful of places that can legitimately be called the buckle of the Bible Belt. We have the world's largest Baptist university, and some of our churches have become worldwide phenomena. Yet, at the same time, the city of Waco, of all the cities in our state with over 50,000 people or more, Waco is the fourth poorest of those. I wonder if God looks at these numbers, and looks at these people, and looks at our churches in size and said, ugh, not again. Now, most of our churches, and yours included, um, recognize this problem and do a lot of work and try really hard to be the people God wants us to be. We give money to charity, we give food to the poor, and we give clothes to those who need it, and y'all do amazing work in this area. Um, and it's all wonderful. We need to keep doing these things, keep doing those things. Don't hear me 
say and don't do those things. But there are broken systems in our country that keep poor people poor and in need of our money. There are broken systems in our country that keep people hungry and, and in need of the food that we give them as charity. That keep people without the means to supply basic necessities for themselves. Broken systems that need to be fixed. And we as God's people need to be on the front lines of demanding justice, of fixing these systems. Now in an election year, this talk from a pulpit can feel a little bit uncomfortable. What's he saying? Think of this, I'm about to make myself a little uncomfortable. If a parent of a family with two kids each has a full-time job that only pays minimum wage, that household is bringing in just a little more than $2,000 a month. That $2,000 has to go to rent, utilities, health care, food, and child care. Now, if you pay the absolute least you can possibly pay for all of these, um, it's going to cost a lot more than $2,000 a month than, than the parents are bringing in. To make up for this deficit, one or both of the parents end up taking another job, which leaves kids at home without guidance, which often leads to children who don't know how to respect authority, who get in trouble with the law, who do poorly in school, who sometimes end up incarcerated because they haven't been taught how to function in society because they have parents working two, three, four, five jobs. Then they have children who have not been given an example to follow, and the cycle keeps going and going and going, spinning out of control. Now, we could keep raising money for charity, which is, again, a good thing. We need to keep doing that. Or, we as the church can be on the front lines fighting against these injustices, trying to fix the broken systems that need to be fixed. The list goes on and on and on, and again, we're in an election year, so just turn on the TV and we're all talking about all of these. I can keep going and make a list that would make us all upset. Um, and in a political, like I said, in a political season, these types of sermons can be tiring because we just want to hear what the Bible says, not what we are told by politicians we need to hear. Just give us the Bible. That's what I heard growing up all the time. Don't talk politics from the pulpit. Just give us the Bible. So I'll close the sermon with a few verses from the Bible and pray that we take them to heart. Leviticus tells us, when a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as a native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. That's from the Bible. Deuteronomy says this, he defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. That's also from the Bible. We hear from Jesus. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And we all remember this verse. His followers said, when did we do any of those things? And Jesus said, anytime you did something like this among the least of these, you did it to me. In Proverbs, we're told, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. For the rights of all who are destitute, speak up and judge fairly. And then lastly, if anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God has given you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. My prayer is that as the people of God, the worship that we do on Sunday mornings will find um, real-life um, action in the things that we do on Monday through Saturday. May it be on earth as it is in heaven.